So good afternoon. My name is uh, Chris Royer. I'm the director, executive director of Anglican Frontier Missions, and it's great to have you all out. And um, you are the bravest, most sturdiest, most endurant, because this is the last map talk of the last day. And I know while many other are dying off or heading to this coffee shop to get a shot of uh, adrenaline or caffeine, you all are here. So you are the champions. Congratulations. <laughs> you can give yourselves a hand. Uh -huh. <laughs> So, well, before we forget, begin this map talk, we're going to begin with a word of prayer. So let's pray. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Father, we thank you that you are God, that you are King, that you are Lord. We pray that you bless this time and bless this talk in the name and the power of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. 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 Well, uh, first slide. Is this one. I uh, want to give you a resource. This is our 25-year anniversary book, Shadows from Light and Approachable. And much of what I talk about today is in the fourth section of this book, sections 13, uh, chapters 13, 14, and 15, section 4. And we talk about doing frontier missions Anglicanly. And much of my own personal journey into Anglicanism is in this book. Uh, when people ask me, what is AFM's vision, I often say it's doing frontier missions Anglicanly. And so first I want to unpack Frontier Missions, then I want to unpack Anglicanly. Uh, we've had some sessions on Frontier Missions, and Frontier Missions, I say, is going where the church is not, going where there's just this much Christian presence or no Christian presence at all. And next slide. One really helpful way to understand missions is a, is a, a, a diagram that Harold Fuller did, and he talks about the four P's of missions. The first P is pioneer, going to a place where the church is not. You need pioneer missionaries like Hudson Taylor, like uh, William Carey, and also modern-day missionaries who go to peoples and places where there's really no established church. The first P is pioneer. The second P, of course, is paternal, and that's not a negative word in this context. It's a father-son, um, mother-daughter spiritual relationship. When people put their faith in Jesus Christ, they need to be discipled. So you have a spiritual father, like Paul, and you have a spiritual son like Timothy. You have a spiritual leader like Jesus and the disciples. But eventually, those disciples, whether they're Paul's or Jesus's or a modern-day missionary's disciples, come to a place where they do ministry alongside of the spiritual mentor, the spiritual father. And that's partnership. And we see this in Jesus's ministry, right? Jesus brought the disciples to a place where eventually they were doing ministry side by side with Jesus. He sent out the 72. He's in telling them to do the ministry. So that's partnership. And then the fourth P is what we all want to see happen is the cross-cultural worker leave and go back to his or her own country and in a partnership phase where the now indigenous growing church only calls on the missionary to come in when they want something special or when they want to invite them to deepen their cross-cultural relationship. But it's not really out of an area of need. These are the four P's of missions, and AFM's heart is to focus on those two first P's. The pioneer going to places where there's little to no gospel presence and then the discipleship, and then start to pull out at the partnership phase. So that's, uh, of course, there's much more that could be said about frontier missions, but this is just something to frame us, frame our, uh, ref give us a frame of reference in this talk. So let's go to the next so slide, uh, please, Susan. And um, we talked about frontier missions a little bit. We're going to skip over this right now in the next slide. And um, so I want to talk about why we should do Frontier Missions Anglicanly. And as Kristen comes in, that reminds me, uh, we have a sign-up sheet right here for emails and newsletters. I'm going to pass this around. And if you'd like to get a prayer e-newsletter and a newsletter once a month in your inbox, please just sign up your name and take this. And Chris, would you just grab this and start passing this around for me, please? Thank you. There's a pen right there. And uh, we have some brochures afterwards. And... Um, We'll tell you how to get those after we're done. Okay, so we're going to go to the first phase of the contextualizability of frontier missions of Anglicanism. And I'm talking a bit fast because I said I have 15 minutes, so you can get this uh, Q&A afterwards. When I first went to Turkey, I was with a great mission organization, OM. Anyone familiar with OM? 
Great. O.M. George Verwer, and I had just actually finished a master's degree at Wheaton in New Testament, so I felt like I had somewhat of a theological and missiological background. We moved down to the city of, um, in southeast Turkey. Muslims started putting their faith in Jesus Christ, and so we started meeting in our living room, first one, and then two, and then three, and we just kind of sat around our couch and we didn't do really any liturgical motions at all. I was not Anglican at the time. And so our worship consisted, ba- consisted basically of sitting. Um, and we sang praises. We said a few prayers. I spoke or I taught every week for maybe 15, 20 minutes. And then we broke out the Turkish tea. <laughs> and uh, that was our worship. And um, the first three guys that came to faith in Jesus Christ, they were, um, you know, Paul says you have not many fathers. I'm your father. You became a son to me. And Paul says about the Philippians, you are my joy and my crown. And when I look at these first three guys who came to faith, I felt like they were my joy and my crown. And we had this, I think, a warm, loving, and transparent relationship. And one day after worship, this one, one of them came up to me and said, Chris, I, just, I know that you're here to share the good news, and I really appreciate all you're doing. But I just got to tell you, this thing that you call worship, I just feel like I'm treating God so lightly every time. I just doesn't feel right. I I, I don't feel like I'm giving God the honor that's due his name. And that was a dagger in the heart for me because these guys are giving up so much to put their faith in Jesus, to meet with me, to leave the religion that they were born into. And somehow, someway, he didn't articulate it perfectly, but he feels like he's not being authentically a follower of God because of the worship that's going on in my living room. And so God challenged me, okay, Chris, we need to contextualize the worship that we're doing. I mean, missions is all about contextualizing the message and the way the message is carried out. Part of contextualization is the ritual and the ceremony. So That got me on a long search, and I started thinking about liturgy. I'd taken a class from Dr. Robert Weber at Wheaton College, rocked my boat, but I didn't know what to do with it. But when this guy said, I just don't feel like I'm worshiping God, I decided to do some prayer and some study. And one of the things I did was went to the great city of Mardin and then uh, in southeastern Turkey. And there's a, a, a monastery there that's 1,500 years old. And I just spent some time retreating and praying and thinking. And I ran into this priest there, an Syriac Orthodox priest. His name was Esau, Jesus. So I started calling him Father Jesus. Now, that messes you up if you call someone Father Jesus enough times, right? But um, Father Jesus, (laughs) there we go, Father Jesus started talking to me about how the Syriac Christians did church and liturgy. And one of the things that rocked my boat and blew my mind is I started doing some research and... The Arabic word for liturgical worship, salat, comes from the Assyrian word for liturgical worship, salat, different pronunciation. And it started dawning on me that as Muhammad was putting it and his, his successors were putting in this system of Islam, they actually just borrow the forms of worship from the Syriac Christians. And of course, in the Psalms, it talks about praying five times a day. And so not only the, 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 the number of times, but the movements of how they prayed. And I started to understand that Muslims, not all, I'm painting with a very broad brush here. And of course, there is a lot of uh, d- diversity and there's a lot of exceptions, but I'm just saying, especially in the Turkic context, and I think in the Arabic context, David Garrison talked about the nine rooms in the house of Islam. So there's a lot of variety, but generally speaking, Turks are liturgical people. They live their lives liturgically. And so then as we were discipling people some more, another guy came up to me and said, Chris, I love this Jesus thing, but um, you know, now that I've become a Christian, what are our holidays? What are our Christian holidays? And I said, well, there's Christmas and there's, there's Easter and two was all that I could pull out. Um, as a non-Anglican, I'm th- I didn't know what Pentecost was. I mean, I heard about it in the book of Acts, but as a, a feast day of the church. And he said, Chris, we've got over 40 religious holidays in Islam. And you've only got two? 
And so I started to think some more about how we do these things. And then I realized that as, as, as Muslims go into the mosques, they have their ablution, they have their ceremonial confession, which they do before they enter the mosque. And I didn't have any really confession of sin in the, in the church service that I was starting to establish. And of course, worship is embodied in Islam. There's physical movement, there's ups and there's downs, there's kneeling and there's prostrations. And not that every Turk would get into this, but some do. And I realized that I was pre- presenting this truncated version of liturgical worship to Muslims. And so I started saying, well, maybe I need to be moving towards the Anglican faith tradition, which I did. Let's go to the second slide there. The second thing is sacraments. Um, we were blown away. The first day I arrived in Turkey, July 4th, 1990, was the Feast of the Sacrifice, or the uh, I forget what it is in Arabic, but the day when they, they sacrificed sheep and goats on the streets. So I arrived in Istanbul. There was blood on the streets everywhere because once a year, Muslims will sacrifice a sheep and a goat. And although Orthodox Islam doesn't teach that, they believe that this forgives their sins for another year. And I don't have pictures. Do can you go to the next one? Do I have a picture of this? Next slide, I don't have a picture, but this happened all the time right in front of our apartment. And then I came to realize that, that blood means something in Islam. It's not just once a year, but when the person who built our apartment building and, and we were living in it, when he started it, he actually sacrificed a sheep and he sprinkled its blood all over the ground on which the apartment building would be built. And then I started realizing that when Turks buy cars, they'll often sacrifice a sheep or a goat and they'll sprinkle the blood on their car for protection. And I remember so clearly there was this movie star in Istanbul. He crashed his car into the Bosphorus Straits and they said to him in an interview, didn't you, Korban Kesmek, didn't you sacrifice a sheep before you started driving the car? He said, I did. They said, well, what are you going to do now? He said, I'm going to sacrifice two next time so I don't get into an accident. So there's a sense that blood is efficacious, that blood has power, and that there's a ceremony behind the blood. And I started thinking, what would be a dynamic equivalent of that? And of course, it's not a long stretch to realize that communion is the blood that takes away sins once for all, that there is power in the blood. And this is not something that just is a ceremony for them, but it's very intuitive and clearly clearly obvious that there is power in the communion, just as there is power in the blood that Muslims sacrifice year after year. So sacrament, and not only sacrament, but baptism. We don't have time for that. The third thing is tradition. So as I'm discipling believers from a Muslim background, I come to realize, wow, they're leaving so much to follow Jesus Christ. And we don't want to extract them from their families. We want them to come to faith in families. And we want to make the switch to Jesus Christ or the transition as easy as possible to put, to lower the barriers, right? Paul says, I become all things to all men, that I may win all. Paul was constantly trying to remove barriers of conversion. And as I'm seeing Muslims come to faith in Jesus Christ, I see that they're not only leaving a religion, they're relieving a religious tradition. And I was not giving them anything as an evangelical to replace that tradition with. And so as I was thinking about what type of tradition do they need, well, they need a tradition that clearly goes back before the Protestant Reformation. They need something that is focused on oral learners. They need something that has um, things that are easily memorizable because most Turks do not read very much and they much would rather memorize things. And actually they have prayers that they memorize in Arabic, even though they don't know what those prayers mean. And so I started thinking, well, what is something that, what is a tradition that I can impart to Turks who are putting their faith in Jesus Christ? And so I said, well, we can start with the Lord's Prayer. That's good. But we also need a prayer of forgiveness, of confession. That's important. We also need ways to greet each other because when Muslims greet each other, they say, Salam Aleikum, Aleikum Salam. And when they say goodbye, they have certain things in each of the different Islamically, uh, Islamic cultures. And so we need a, a way to greet each other when we come into worship. And we need something that shows that there is no division or barrier before we approach the Lord's table. We need something for the peace. And so all of this stuff started saying, wow, there is a tradition 
that I don't have to reinvent that goes all the way back to the first century and has been tweaked and modified through um, the Reformation and through the Church of England. But there is a tradition through which Muslims can, uh, can grab hold of. And so when I was becoming Anglican in the, er, in the 2000s, um, I spent my first two, three years in Istanbul. And one of the first believers in the, in the Turkish church in 1987 came to faith. One of the three leaders at the part of the first church. And as, as I was becoming Anglican, he was. And he said something to me, something so powerful. He said, Chris, when you American missionaries came over to Turkey, I praise God that you did, but you thrust upon us this American independent church tradition, and it is not suitable for our culture. And so he said, Chris, I'm becoming Anglican. I need something with roots. I need something that's global. I need something that is contextualizable to our culture. And I think the best fit just happens to be Anglicanism. And so today, AFM is partnering with the church that he started in Istanbul, doing a, a church of Muslim background believers that is liturgical, that is sacramental, and that embraces the prayer book tradition. So two takeaways. Next slide, please, Susan. As I challenge people in the Episcopal and Anglican churches in the USA, um, one, prioritize frontier missions. I talked about that last night in my message. And takeaway number two, I invite you, I encourage you, I challenge you to do frontier missions Anglicanly. In the 1910s, the Episcopal Church punted on foreign missions. We abolished our board of foreign missions. That was a sad day. So the Anglican and Episcopal Church in North America have 100 years of apathy and ignorance when it comes to frontier missions, which meant that when there were Episcopalians and Anglicans with a passion for missions, they wouldn't even consider an Anglican organization because there weren't any through which to do their service. They would go to great groups like Frontiers and OM and Pioneers and so many other agencies, but it is a new day in the global Anglican world. And now we are having agencies rise up not only in North America but across the globe that are merging ecclesiology and missiology, sacramentalism and discipleship. And so as you have people in your midst with a call, with a passion for frontier missions, my plea is that you do frontier missions Anglicanly. And that has been 15 minutes, so my time is up. And now I'm instructed to ask for Q and A for the next 15 minutes. So uh, questions, please just raise your hand, shout it out loud so we can all hear. The question is, has the prayer book been translated into Turkish? No, not the whole thing. They're actually using common worship from England, and they're translating it as they have need, like they haven't had any deaths yet, so probably that the, this funeral service will be, um, or last rites will be translated when that happens. Um, so it's, and the resources, of course, are strapped, so no, it hasn't. Other questions? Yes, Susan. Yes, that's a great question. So Susan mentioned that in this book, and these are $10, they're at the Trinity, the, the Trinity Bookstore, they're also at our booth, and in the fourth section we try to begin a discussion of what that means. Uh, so there's a guy in Kazakhstan doing church planning, and uh, he went home on furlough, and he's Pentecostal charismatic type. And uh, when he came back home, he realized that Kazakhstan, he saw that his leaders, the Kazakh Muslim background believers had a clergy shirt and a collar on, and it freaked him out. And his first question to them was, where did you get the collar and the clergy shirt? And they said, oh, we just went online to CMS Almy. We got it shipped from England. <laughs> and his next question was, why in the world are you wearing a collar and a clergy shirt? And they said, in our tradition, religious leaders dress religiously. We are now religious leaders we need to be faithful to the Kazakh culture. And as I have a Baptist friend in China, he said he was going to the shops and talking with people all the time about religious things. And he said, but when he put a cross around his neck and he got some uh, prayer beads that Buddhist monks have, he was, he, started, was, he was taken seriously for the first time. And actually, um, 
in Turkey too as well. When I started wearing a cross, I, wasn't, I didn't have the courage to do it all the time. But when I did that, people would say, wow, this guy is a religious guy. And it's as if I'm in a different status. So it's very important, I think, and meant not all. I mean, none of this is transferable. We're painting with a broad brush. But this is the beauty of the Anglican tradition. We have a religious dress code. And most of the world, religious leaders, Muslim, Buddhist, Hindu, they dress religiously. And so I think this is part of the tradition. Also, you know, um, we have a, a, an established order, which I think helps in church plants. It can help to avoid chaos and confusion because in many of these cultures, they don't want a democratic government in their church. I mean, just as chaos. And as I was trying to just invite believers to make decisions on things, I think at too early a stage, they say, Chris, you're our leader. You know, you make the decision. <laughs> we don't want to vote. We just want you to do it. And, and, and eventually, praise the Lord, we were able to raise up someone who was recognized as a leader, and then he was the leader. Of course, you need to have counts, accountability and transparency and a whole nine yards. But I think the more hierarchical church structure can, not necessarily does, but can lend to more stability in church planning. Uh, other questions? Yeah. Yeah, so the question is, um, one of the things um, that's a hot topic now is colonialism and post-colonialism, and he's wondering if we faced uh, those types of things overseas. Uh, yes and no. Um, it was amazing. I got accused often of being a CIA agent, you know. People really thought that I worked for the CIA because their, their mentality was, okay, you seem like you're relatively bright and relatively ambitious, and you've learned our language to a relatively strong degree. So why in the world would you be in Turkey? <laughs> you know, what's your hidden motive? Why would you do this? And of course, uh, many Muslims do not separate the secular and the spiritual. So the assumption is, you know, this guy is a Christian, so he's working for the American government. He's trying to pollute our youth. He's trying to do something to destabilize Turkey. It's uh, colonialism 2.0, not from the British or the French, but now it's the Americans who are the colonializers. And of course, the Americans have air force bases in all over Turkey, and Turkey's a part of NATO, and the Americans are treating NATO unfair. So you are a government agent, or you, know, you have the power, this happened to me all the time. Chris, you know, I'm a single Muslim guy. If I convert, can you find me an American wife? That happened. Or will you give me $100? You know, are there, do are there $100 bills? And, and so, and oftentimes, single guys would really think that if they would convert, I would give them an American wife. And it became so, such a pain in the rear. Um, I actually married a Korean, beautiful Korean woman. And so eventually, my answer became, uh, do you see my wife? And they said, yes. I said, is she American? They said, no, she's a Korean. So I'd say, if I couldn't find an American wife for myself, what in the world makes you think I can find one for you? So that colonial, you know, this thing that we come from a position of power and we are imposing our will and we can give them things for their conversion if they will acquiesce, that is still, at least in the Turkish context, very real, which makes it very important to come in humility, which means it's very important to learn language and to humble ourselves and to come in a position of powerlessness and weakness, come as learners and come as servants. Yeah, that's a great question. Other questions? Yeah, back there. Yeah, absolutely. My wife is an ex-Buddhist, okay? She was um, she grew, she, uh, in a nominal Buddhist household in Korea. And, uh, she, man, when I wanted to become Anglican, she was pushing back like crazy because she said, you know, I'm in a Presbyterian church in Korea. It has 50,000 members. Is there a church like that, Chris, in the U.S., Anglican, that has 50,000 members? 
I said, no. She said, well, when there is one, I'll convert to Anglicanism. <laughs> but, um, but eventually she said yes. And, um, you know, in the Buddhist ritual, there's, there, it's, it's, it's embodied worship. And um, when she saw we were in an Anglican church in the U.S. and we were taking communion, and when she saw my daughters kneeling at the communion rail and lifting their hands up like this in a posture of weakness and dependence, it got her. Because she thought, where else in American culture are kids taught to kneel and lay out their hands in dependence on someone greater than themselves? And so also in this chapter, this is the Anglican Church of Nepal, the picture on this cover. And one of our guys in the early 90s, Norman Beale and Beth Beale, went to uh, Nepal And they weren't trying to start an Anglican church at all. They just were trying to start a church because in the 90s, 80s and 90s, there was really this sense in missions that we do not impose our denominational preferences on anyone. We give them Jesus, only Jesus, just Jesus. And so when I was in Turkey in the early 90s, we had interagency missional meetings. And in the real sense, there was Frontiers guys and OM and Pioneers and crew. We're just going to give them Jesus, which, of course, is not possible because we all come with our presuppositions and just giving them Jesus means we're not giving them sacraments and we're not giving them liturgy and we're not giving them other things. And so, um, so Norman is in Nepal and these, this is pre-internet days, so this is radical. The Nepali Tamang, West Tamang Christians that had come to faith came to Norman. They said, we hear that you're Anglican. Is that true? And Norman, he'd never worn a collar, never said anything, said, yeah, that's true. We hear that you do this thing called communion. Is that true? And says, Norman says, yeah, I've I've celebrated communion before. He hadn't done it with them at all. They said, we want to do that with you now. He said, sure, yeah, let's, we'll do it next week. I'll teach you what it means. I'll teach you the the rhythms and the flows. And they said, no, we want to do it right now. And Norman said, oh, you're not going to do it right now. So they went through a week of training and just did what communion means, why we're doing what we do. They came to the Sunday. They had the communion service. And after they came out of the communion service, the Nepali West Tamang Christians said, that was the most incredible worship experience we've ever had. We feel that we can be West Tamang and we can be Christian, that we can do both at the same time, that we're not chucking one at the door. And so they said, we want to do that again. And Norman said, of course, we can do it again next Sunday. And he said, they said, no, we want to do it again right now. <laughs> Two services in one day, exact same thing. And, and Norman said, no, we're not going to do it again right now. So there's this sense, and it's, you know, those are anecdotal things, but there are movements, huge bodies of Christ in India right now that are drawn into the Anglican faith tradition. And um, one of them is Good Shepherd Church of India, which used to be OM India, one of the oldest missional movements in India, started in the 60s with George Verwer. And they've said, now we want to become Anglican because of a lot of different reasons. But part of it is, I think what we're getting at is what Anglicanism has is not something that we boast about, not something that we're arrogant or proud about. We have a gift that's been given to us, and this gift of sacrament, liturgy, and a tradition within which to worship Jesus is grounded in the scriptures itself, and it's also grounded in human nature itself. That, you know, um, James A.K. Smith in his book, Desiring the Kingdom, talks that we are liturgical creatures at heart. And so I believe what Anglicanism is tied into actually some of the basic DNA that we have as human beings, and it's certainly tied into the scriptures as well. Other questions or comments? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. How would this apply in a very secular context? You know, I haven't really thought about that, but if anyone else has a question, an observation on that, because that's not been my world at all. Well, this is in the, in, the early, in the early 90s we had them, and I didn't decide to promote Anglicanism at all. So this, my journey sort of began in 2002, 2003, and we didn't have interagent, I'm sorry, it began in the 90s, 
Uh, but we were in a city where there were hardly any believers. There were like four or six, so we didn't have these deep theological discussions. But what happened very interestingly, in Turkey at least, the foreigners said, we're not going to bring in Baptist or Lutheran or Methodist or anything, but the Turks themselves went out and became Foursquare, or they went out and became Presbyterian, and they realized that being connected to a global body of some denomination brought stability, brought order, brought greater resources, not just money, but also in training. So this sort of idealistic foreigner missionary, we're not going to bring anything but Jesus. It wasn't the Western missionary so much that cracked it up. It was more the Turks who said, like my friend who was one of the five most prominent leaders in the Turkish church, he said, I'm becoming an Anglican. So, um, yeah, that has kind of gone by the way now, actually, in many places. And, and the Turks unapologetically said, we need... We need a body of believers bigger than ourselves. And, and, and just one story on that anecdotal. So we were planning this church in, in, in Adana, and uh, one of the believers said, Chris, you're going to go one day. All cross-cultural workers go. When you go, our, our, name, our church name was the Adana Protestant Church. Very bland, very generic. Adana is the city, Protestant church. When we go, who, who's going to know about us? Who's going to remember us? Who's going to think about us when persecution comes? Who's going to pray for us when the next earthquake hits? They hit every 7, 10, 15 years. And man, they, they bring devastation. So there's this desire to be tied to a group of believers greater and more global than themselves. Other questions? And we have room maybe for one or two more. Um, yeah, go ahead. How would these principles, and can you, uh, with these VBS model, can you elucidate your question a little bit more? That is a great question because that's come to me many times. And there's a seminary professor here, uh, Brad, I forgot your last name, Roderick. Roderick at Southeastern. And we've talked about this. And this is something that I think we need academic work on to reconcile. Um, I think one way is to ordain missionary bishops. And they've done this in Nigeria. So like in the 80s, when 88, when William Carey declared the 90s a decade of evangelism, the Nigerian church actually took it seriously and went did evangelism in the 90s. And what they did is they ordained missionary bishops to go to a place, northern Nigeria, where there was no church. And so he's the apostol apostolically gifted people. And so they're doing uh, Discovery Bible studies, but he's actually baptizing. He's starting communion right away. He's uh, appointing people to lead communion right away, leaders among the groups. So I think if we can get back into that model, I think there can be some some um uh what we could say some uh whatever there can be some progress in that but i think this is an area that we anglicans need to work on i don't think they're incompatible but certainly discovery bible studies and church planning movements start from the ground up and anglicanism tends to start from the top down and i think we can merge that with some good uh, scholarly work yes Yeah, so he's saying the model in Acts is the broader church and the church sending and receiving believers to each other and not isolate. Uh, there's a connection and there's a belonging. It's not isolated silos with each other. That's right. Okay, one more question or two more questions. Anyone else? All right, well, I encourage you all to get some literature. I don't know where that is, and please get the sign-up sheet back to me. Let me uh, just pray for us as we close today. Father in heaven, we thank you for liturgy and sacrament. We thank you for a global body of Christ, and we thank you that you want us to be one, visibly one, as you and um, your son Jesus and the Spirit are one. Father, we uh, pray that you help us, uh, as, as we are Anglicans, Episcopalians here, we not uh, boast, we're not arrogant, we're not uh, puffed up, Lord, because we know that only love edifies and so, Lord, we want to be proud first and foremost of who you are and identify with you as followers of Jesus Christ. And God, I pray that we would have the attitude that we have been given a gift, that we have the privilege of passing on in humility and love to those who 
want to receive it. We thank you for uh, your son, Jesus. We thank you for the spirit poured on our hearts. And we pray these things, Father, in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you so much for coming, and God bless you all. Thank you, Susan.